Foundation researcher Marcus Hernandez was a professional in all aspects of his job. He was intelligent, being scouted for a job at the Foundation right out of college. He was brave, unyielding in the faces of the horrifying creatures and dangerous situations that working with the anomalous practically guaranteed. But most importantly, researcher Hernandez was cautious. He not only knew that keeping his hands at a fair distance from any newly discovered anomalous objects was a safe way to keep his head, he was also aware that it was sometimes better to take risks that would further his knowledge about an anomaly and how best to contain it. Sometimes those risks came with a price, like being part of the first team to study a recently discovered anomaly. To researcher Hernandez, it was better to lose the lives of the ones working to protect humanity from what lies in the dark than have any unsuspecting civilian stumble upon something potentially life-threatening. That's why he and his team took the assignment of studying SCP-1437 before anyone else in the Foundation was able to. They simply were not sure of what it was capable of, and researcher Hernandez's known attention to detail and cautious nature could best help the Foundation not only establish proper containment procedures, but also ensure that their own personnel were safe while doing so. As researcher Hernandez sat in the back of a jeep that rolled and tumbled over the arid landscape of the Mojave Desert, he reviewed what the Foundation knew about the anomaly. Unfortunately, it wasn't much. For starters, it was a 3 meter by 3 meter hole in the ground, originally thought to be an ordinary cave. As a result of its deceiving appearance, the anomaly went unnoticed for decades, until the Foundation picked up on a local story that was the talk of the town for a small group of camping and hiking hobbyists in Nevada. A camper, while out exploring and trekking through the dry dunes of the Mojave, was struck in the back of the neck with a U.S. quarter. While the object by itself is harmless, it came flying at the camper's body at an incredibly high speed, shooting from a large hole in the ground and striking hard enough to break the skin and wedge itself inside the camper's neck. After reaching the local hospital and getting the coin removed, it still left a small scar across the back of the camper's head. This unusual event prompted Foundation reconnaissance, which turned out to be entirely warranted, as observation of the surrounding area found several more objects buried around the area that were believed to have emerged from the hole, now designated as SCP-1437. A small canoe, decorated with luminescent patterns, a calculator that added and subtracted letters instead of numbers, and a rotten apple core were all objects strewn around the immediate area. And if that's not strange enough, attempts to map out the hole failed, as all measuring equipment was lost after reaching a certain depth. Before the initial observation team picked up and left, SCP-1437 shot out large quantities of rock and dirt for over an hour, confirming that objects emerged from the hole at high speeds. Chemical analysis of the objects found around the area showed that they were composed of materials either unknown or not commonly found on Earth to warrant use in mass production. The observation team came up with a hypothesis. SCP-1437 was a hole that led to a parallel universe, and the objects it shot out originated in said location. Researcher Hernandez knew that this was just a hypothesis, but he had reviewed the lab results himself. Those objects certainly did not come from anywhere on Earth, and if the hole functioned as a gateway between worlds, that could explain why the measuring equipment was lost after a certain point. The jeep came to a stop, and when researcher Hernandez stepped out, he came face to face with SCP-1437, a large hole sitting in the Mojave Desert. His crew was already hard at work, surveying and excavating the surrounding area for any other objects the hole had shot out that had been lost to time. A mobile analysis lab tent was set up in the distance, as well as several trailers for personnel living on site. Researcher Hernandez's personal decision to not use D-Class personnel in his research meant that each risk the SCP-1437 team took had to be calculated differently. They wouldn't send a person into the hole and risk loss of life when a drone could serve the same function without the potential drawbacks. But still, the initial observation team lost all of their equipment while trying to measure SCP-1437's depth. Why waste an expensive drone when the result would most likely turn out the same? It was these decisions that earned Hernandez's fame and respect at the Foundation. And over the next few weeks, his team was able to develop a wide knowledge base regarding SCP-1437 
and establish safe containment procedures to keep the anomaly hidden from the public and easy to work with for Foundation personnel. First, a two-meter-tall electric fencing unit was built around the perimeter of SCP-1437. This fence would not only keep unwanted trespassers out, but also had defensive capabilities due to the harmful electrical charge it could emit upon contact with an object. Groups of three security guard personnel were assigned to patrol this fence at all times, and they were instructed to deal with any trespassers through standard Foundation protocol. They would be taken into custody, interrogated, and as long as they were unaware of SCP-1437's anomalous properties, given a healthy dose of amnestics and released back into the general public. Anything that emerged from SCP-1437, be it a physical object or a living organism, would be catalogued by the Foundation and tested immediately for any potential hazards before further analysis could begin. If found to be safe, the items would be studied as much as possible. If not, they were stowed away in an area intended to keep them contained until a safe way to examine them was found. But perhaps the most important containment procedure researcher Hernandez established was the forbiddance of testing with SCP-1437. Due to the anomaly's mysterious nature and incredibly likely potential connection to parallel universes, testing could have grave and unforeseen consequences. When dealing with alternate or parallel timelines or realities, the Foundation is incredibly cautious and only interacts in ways that they're absolutely sure will not have any unexpected damage on baseline reality. That, and researcher Hernandez wasn't exactly keen on attracting the attention of these parallel universes without a solid understanding of who and what they were. As he would come to find, this inclination proved to be beneficial. As the team observed SCP-1437, they documented a number of notable objects that emerged from the hole, each supposedly originating from a parallel world. The first of which, however, was not anything the team hadn't seen before. The initial observation team sent to test whether SCP-1437 was actually anomalous had observed the hole emitting a mass of rock and dirt. For over an hour, SCP-1437 spewed earthen materials without stopping, filling the surrounding areas with debris. Since this was before the research team theorized the hole was connected to parallel realities, they weren't sure what to make of it. Was it a natural eruption? A poorly documented earthquake that somehow sent chunks of rock and dirt to the surface and shooting out of the hole? Though somewhat stumped, researcher Hernandez's team eventually came to a single, solid conclusion. If SCP-1437 led to a parallel world or worlds, Whoever was on the other side of the hole may have been attempting to fill it using natural materials. If they were attempting to fill it, could they be trying to contain it? Did the parallel world on the other side of SCP-1437 have its own foundation? This sudden thought gave researcher Hernandez pause and made him reconsider his hands-off approach to SCP-1437. Should his team attempt to contact whoever was on the other side? If it was a parallel branch of the foundation, this behavior would be encouraged. The Foundation communicated with alternate versions of itself in time and space all of the time. The Department of Temporal Anomalies was built around this premise, but these were exceptions, not the rules. And communication with alternate Foundations was always carried out with utmost safety and precaution. It was only done when there was a certainty that risk would be avoided. Researcher Hernandez was sure he made the correct decision, and he would stray away from attempting to contact those on the other side of the anomaly, even if they were another world's incarnation of the SCP Foundation. Weeks later, Researcher Hernandez was awoken in the middle of the night by an excited assistant who, after calming herself down, informed him that SCP-1437 had spat out a new object. You have to forgive her if you were out in the desert for weeks staring at a hole waiting for it to do something and it eventually did it, you'd be pretty excited too. When researcher Hernandez ran outside to see what the team was freaking out about, he could have jumped for joy too. SCP-1437 wasn't spitting out rocks and dirt anymore. This time, it was a map, clearly illustrated to depict the continent of North America. But upon closer inspection, the team noticed some very apparent differences from a traditional map in the geography of our world. The map was written entirely in Spanish, and the names of countries and states it listed didn't match their existing counterparts. In fact, the entire borderlines of the map were mismatched, out of place, and radically different from anything resembling North America. It listed the government of the entire continent of North America as 
La República Popular de Aguas Nuevas, or when translated to English, the People's Republic of New Waters. This exciting find was logged and archived, and it was only the first of a series of objects that emerged from SCP-1437. A few days later, another object was documented. This time, it was a photograph. After initial scans determined the object to be safe to view, not harboring any dangerous mimetic triggers upon viewing or anything of that nature, the team analyzed the picture to the best of their abilities. They saw a breathtaking vista of a city skyline, unlike anything possible on this world. Intertwined with buildings were massive structures that appeared to be made out of coral. They wrapped around skyscrapers, branching from the ground and sometimes emerging from the buildings themselves. The coral broke through the tops of the tallest buildings, putting the man-made titans to shame. In the far background, a massive flying creature can be seen peacefully floating through the air. This otherworldly visual overwhelmed the team, but after the initial shock wore down, a keen-eyed junior researcher pointed out that many of the buildings resembled known landmarks, though they were radically altered in noticeable ways. This wasn't just any city. It was New York City, only this time with coral and giant floating creatures, exactly what the Big Apple's been missing this entire time. But this was still comprehensible and understandable for the Foundation. SCP-1437's true weirdness was still yet to come. A few days after the photograph emerged, SCP-1437 shot out a truly peculiar find. Researcher Hernandez and his team were stumped as to what its purpose was and what it signified, but they determined the objects to be completely safe and archived them regardless. The items in question were a series of discs made from solid gold, varying in size but never being obscenely large. Accompanying the disc was a sheet of paper that read, Please send more rain. The Foundation was understandably puzzled. One working theory researcher Hernandez put together was that whoever was on the opposite side of SCP-1437 was paying tribute to the whole as a form of worship and was asking the almighty beings on the other side to send more rain, for whatever reason. While the Foundation didn't exactly send the rain over themselves, whoever sent that request was probably pleased when a thunderstorm the next week sent torrents of rainwater into SCP-1437. We hope they're happy. The most notable discoveries that emerged from SCP-1437 occurred over a multi-year period. Previously, the research team theorized that SCP-1437 was connected to a single reality and that whoever was on the other side of it was sending objects through, either by chance or by means of communication. This discovery proved that there wasn't just one parallel world connecting to SCP-1437, but many, an unknown amount, in fact. The items in question this time weren't just objects, but human cadavers. One by one over the years, inner space between the various oddities that SCP-1437 also spat out were human corpses, dead on arrival. The bodies were clad in Foundation-issue D-Class uniforms, though with some slight variations. This proved that the worlds connected to SCP-1437 were, in fact, alternate versions of the Foundation, or at least some of the worlds as there was no way to tell who, what, or where the objects that emerged from SCP-1437 came from. Researcher Hernandez and his team examined the bodies with care and determined that they were dead long before they hit the ground and that the gateway between worlds triggered the cause of death as they traveled between realities. Inside the D-Class jumpsuits, the team discovered pieces of paper, manuscripts that detailed their world's foundation's documentation on SCP-1437. This deliberate inclusion of documentation signaled to the research team that there was an attempt at communication and cooperation from one world's foundation to theirs. But why? The first body was clearly in adequate physical condition. It was protected due to being clothed in a pressure suit with an attached oxygen supply. The documentation read similarly to the SCP Foundation's documentation. Though instead of special containment procedures and an object class, SCP-1437 was given a safety rating and safety containment procedures. These detail the foundation that was giving civilians tours of their anomalies, where they could take photographs and even get close enough to view the anomaly from a close distance. The rest of the file was similar to what Hernandez's team recorded, and listed the following objects as those that emerged from SCP-1437. One small pyramid composed of concrete, large quantities of dirt and rocks, a landscape painting, believed to be a location in Scotland, 
According to the painting, its originating universe's sun is blue and its sky yellow. Several discs made from solid gold. Accompanying the discs was a sheet of paper reading, Please Stop Plague, a photograph of several scientists. All scientists pictured have unusually long fingers, estimated to be nearly 25 centimeters long. A sheet of paper reading, Thank you, please send more gifts. The file continued with a notice explaining that the bodies of orange jumpsuited individuals holding documentation of the anomaly emerge from the hole. The file's unfamiliarity with jumpsuits indicate that this world lacks a concept of D-Class personnel. The file mentions that, on the 15th of August 2012, a volunteer from the Foundation, Marco Perton, entered SCP-1437 wearing safety gear, taking with him a copy of this document. The second D-Class body examined by Hernandez's team was branded with the phrase, Property of the SCP Corporation. The file described an item with a threat level of little and a foundation that was more focused on profit than containment. After objects emerged from the hole, they were authorized to be sold to any interested collectors. Objects described by this version of the foundation include a statue of what is believed to be a reptilian entity sporting numerous eyes and tails, large quantities of dirt and rocks, a glass bottle of water, a human femur covered in saliva, a cube comprised of several smaller cubes, all of which are different colors, purpose unknown, a soccer ball, ball only has five sides. The file included the SCP Corporation describing D-Class showing up, as they did in other worlds, and then the Corporation happily sending several D-Classes of their own through the hole in an attempt to communicate with whoever was on the other side. The third D-Class body examined was heavily bandaged and appeared to be blinded. There were lacerations on its arms and legs, and its tongue had been removed. The file described a foundation akin to a religious cult. SCP-1437 was given a heathen level of unforgivable, and its holding measures described a high priest having to bless the hole every two years, and the need to perform blood sacrifices into it to ward off any demons. The wild incarnation of the Foundation interpreted SCP-1437 as a portal to the underworld, and described a list of objects emerging from it. It read as follows, Several discs made from solid gold. Accompanying the disc was a sheet of paper reading, Please Kill Foes. Large quantities of dirt and rocks, believed to be an attempt by demons to harm the High Priest, who was present at the holding site at the time. The broken remains of a human arm, covered in saliva. A photograph of a metal bird flying away from a city. What appears to be a large mushroom is visible behind the bird, believed to be an attempt by demons at mocking us. A human eye which moved when touched, believed to be a lesser demon, was burnt immediately. Unlike the other worlds, when this one received D-Classes through SCP-1437, the religious fanatics believed the bodies to be demons wearing the skin of men and threw the bodies back in the hole. The next D-Class body observed by Hernandez's team was the most curious. It was a heavily emaciated child who had apparently been lobotomized. It described a foundation that sounds more like an organization out of a dystopian science fiction novel than anything else. The file spoke of a group of beings referred to as our masters above all, which the foundation answered to. Any objects emerging from SCP-1437 were brought before the masters. Any trespassers were interrogated by the masters. This foundation believed the objects SCP-1437 shot out were gifts for the masters. Their list reads as follows. 1. Diamond. Large quantities of dirt and rocks. Varg from the extinct Quercus Buccii, the lower half of a human body, delivering to supervising servant of our masters above. It is currently unknown how the gift sender was aware of the diet of our masters above. A document was sent into SCP-1437 thanking the gift giver for the object and requesting further tributes to our masters above. A bottle of human intended wine. While they certainly enjoyed the food of the human body, the wine was clearly misinterpreted. For whatever reason, this foundation interpreted the wine as an assassination attempt on the masters above all. As a result, they sent a large, anomalously powered explosive through SCP-1437 and into the world of an unsuspecting foundation. The file continues with a notice from this foundation's O5-1 which reads, This is a reminder of why we must be vigilant in our containment procedures. From now on, I don't want any of these gifts being taken out of containment. They are a clear and present danger to our masters above. Looks like researcher Hernandez had the correct idea about not wanting to risk experimenting with SCP-1437. 
attracting the attention of a reality where the almighty O5 Council answers to an even more powerful human-eating group of masters above all? <laughs> no thank you. This reality's foundation is perfectly content alone. Now go check out SCP-1322 Glory Hole and SCP-3001 Red Reality for more anomalous parallel universe-related SCPs.